so this is lecture three of ECE 503. So what we just seen in the previous two lectures, in lecture one, we saw the high level motivation uh, for why we're using, uh, why, why we care about DSP, about discrete time signals and systems, um, and how it relates to our world today. Um, in lecture two, we saw sort of like the core translator between the continuous time and discrete time world, without which uh, all of this would be pretty much impossible. So what we're going to look at now in this lecture are really sort of the discrete time signals and systems fundamentals. So um, this is more of like a laundry list of, yeah, I know, like laundry, uh, laundry list of terminology and representations and functions and the like. But for the most part, what it should be providing all of you with is this idea of like, you know, here are the basic tools, rules, and associations. You should be, it should be almost vocabulary like for the rest of this course, okay? So we're going to start off with some basic waveforms. There's also uh, a, a bunch of terminology that we're going to go through, uh, some different rules, and, and that would pretty much kind of round out this entire lecture. It's not, a, it's not a long lecture. There's not really any derivations and the like, but uh, there are a lot of these um, uh, definitions that, um, you know, to highlight and then for all of you to sort of review offline afterwards, okay? So, um, so really what we're going to do is we're going to break this up into discrete time signals and discrete time systems, all right? So first of all, um, looking from the discrete time signals perspective, uh, there are uh, a several fundamental discrete time signals you should be all aware of. And, and of that, I would say there are only really two. Um, but I put two more just to confuse all of you. Ha, ha, ha. No, no, seriously, seriously. Uh, what happens is uh, the two biggies, okay, the big, really important waveforms are this guy here, the unit sample sequence. This is my delta Dirac function, but in the discrete time domain. So this guy, I can design almost any other discrete time waveform. I just have to sum up lots of these guys with different amplitude values to create any waveform that my heart desires. The other guy, the unit step function, is a time saver. Because with that guy, you can create, like, well, step functions. You can create rectangular wave functions. You can create different patterns over long, long number of samples just based off of the unit step signal. The other two I don't see as much, but I would still su suggest that you're aware of them. One is the unit ramp function. So the unit ramp function, what it does is essentially just progressively and steadily builds in regular increments. Um, once, uh, uh, basically, it's a collection of those unit sample sequences, like one after another after another, but it's steadily increasing, like doubling and tripling and quadrupling. And so it has this kind of linear characteristic. And the other guy, the exponential s signal, on the other hand, is different in the sense that, essentially, it assumes a characteristic of an exponential function, but is a discrete time version of one. All right? So just, you know, just in terms of having in your vocabulary, in your tool chest, if you will, these four waveforms, okay? And really, the first two is all you really need, but the other two don't, it doesn't hurt to have the other two. The other thing, and this is out of, I wouldn't say pure laziness, but you know, me keeping track of everything, I'm, I'm pretty poor of nomenclature, is you might notice, and in your textbook, he's way better. Proacus, Manilacus, are w they're way better at this than I am. Um, the formality is usually when you have a discrete time waveform or signal or system and such, you have rectangular brackets, right, surrounding your discrete time index, n. And so you have x, x can be lowercase or uppercase, Rectangular brackets, <gasps> I think it's discrete time, and boom. Like, you know, that's the nomenclature. Usually, um, and then continuous time, you have x round parentheses t, right? And so the round versus rectangular usually kind of give a hint as to whether you're dealing in discrete time or continuous time. In, from this point onwards, we're not going to be dealing too much with continuous time. So, uh, again, like, if I accidentally use round parentheses with n, it's discrete, okay? So, so, so I, I might goof and use round instead of rectangular, and wherever that happens, 
essentially, if you see something n instead of t, that, uh, that to me that denotes um, that we're, we're dealing in discrete time space. All right. So here are some of the concepts that all of you should be mindful of. And we're going to start off, first of all, with this idea of uh, energy and power of a signal. Okay. So what happens is in the continuous time domain, how do you find the energy or the power of a signal? Well, you take the magnitude squared of the signal, and then you integrate it. Um, and, and depending on whether it's periodic or aperiodic or, or whatnot, you, you divide it by the period. Right? Um, I forgot which one's which. But essentially, uh, signal, uh, uh, signal energy and the um, power of a signal uh, are both related with the exception of that uh, normalization by the period. In this case, um, when we deal with discrete time signal and trying to find its energy or its power, what we do is we instead take that signal, we take the magnitude squared of it, and instead of doing an integral, we do a summation across all its samples. And oh, OK, so energy is the one. OK, ha ha, OK, I finally figured it out. So energy, you do not normalize by the signal period. On the other hand, power you do, right? So in this case, you have power. Um, you do, it's almost identical to energy. And what happens is, in this case, you set the limits going from minus, in, uh, you set n goes to infinity um, in, in this guy's case. The periodicity and aperiodic, well, it's, it's implied in the, in, the, in the name itself. So if you notice that your waveform repeats itself in terms of samples. So in this case, if you find that this guy here, this expression here, so let's say you have some big N. You discover a big N in your waveform such that for all N, all little N, X of N plus big N is equal to X of little N, it's periodic. So if you can show that, you've just proven that your waveform is periodic. If you can't show that for all little n, it ain't periodic. Okay. Nothing too fancy about that. Symmetry. Oh, this one's actually pretty cool. So there's even and there's odd. And you know my, um, you know I always joke around saying, oh yeah, that waveform there is uh, is odd. Mm. You know. But but what does that mean? What does odd mean? Like, you know, it's odd, like, you know, it's an odd waveform. Did I hurt its feelings? No. What happens is odd just re refers to the shape. Like, basically around the y-axis, whether you have symmetry or anti-symmetry, right? So, so let's go back to this guy. So first of all, if, if a waveform is even, So let's say that's your discrete time waveform. That's 0. What happens is around the y-axis, okay, it's a little sloppy, you essentially have you know, identical stems on both sides of that y-axis, okay, from minus infinity to infinity. On the other hand, so this is even. For odd, it's a little different. For odd, what you've got is essentially, and it's impossible otherwise, you have nothing at the origin. And what you've got instead is, if you have this guy here, you kind of have the, the negative of that guy. You have that guy here. You have the negative of that guy, and so on and so forth. So what you essentially do is you have around the y-axis, the, the negative of the other guy. So it's like it's, it's anti-symmetric, right? So, so it's th this guy over here. So basically, if you look at, well, let me go back to that diagram because I think that best describes it. So around the y-axis, if the point, if one point on the positive side, you find its matching point on the negative side, is exactly the same amplitude, but it's negative, and you have that for all points. So essentially, it's like anti-symmetric. It's like this. We call it odd. Okay. So that's the difference between even and odd. So that's why odd waveforms don't get their feelings hurt. I know, bad joke. I know, it's only 8.30. Everyone's like, uh, enough of the jokes. Okay. 
Um, this is actually, uh, th these next two guys are also kind of important because they will help us do convolution later on. So there's something called time shifting. So this is actually critically important for this course if you're going to do anything in terms of manipulating waveforms. So what time shifting is, is essentially I have a discrete time waveform. I want to shift it three, three time units, discrete time units um, forward, right? What do I do? Um, that, that waveform, if it's x of n, and I want to advance it in time, uh, would be x of n minus 3, such that you get this sort of property over here, right? We're going to see a lot of that in this course. So what we're going to have is we're going to have lots of, like, you know, delayed elements in, of different waveforms all summed together. And we're going to see this later on when we deal with something called delay elements. Time reflection, on your hand, again, is almost like similar to even and odd, but we're not looking for symmetry. What instead we're doing is uh, we use the y-axis and we rotate the waveform. We pivot the waveform around the y-axis. So, okay, maybe, maybe that requires a little bit of drawing, too. So, so again, so let's, let's go, first of all, to, um, you know, time shifting. So, let's say this is x of n. Uh, see, I'm using square. And then we have like this guy here. And let's say 0 is here. And I want to actually shift this by 3 units. I want to shift this waveform such that that point is now at 0, that point's at 1, that point's at 2, and so on and so forth. So I want to shift it by 3. What do I do? So I have essentially x n minus 3. And that will accomplish that time shifting, right? So let's say everything else here is 0, 0, 0, 0. So now what you've got is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And that's at 0. And then, uh, actually, yeah. And then we have this, we have this, we have this. So we get essentially the same waveform, but shifted by three elements. And it's represented by this guy here. On the other hand, if we want to do a flip around the y-axis, so let's say we have something that looks like this. So here's 0. And we want to flip this guy around the y-axis. Uh, what we would do is instead of y x of n, I, I mean, sorry, x of n, we would have x of minus n. And that would accomplish, ladies and gentlemen, that flip around the y-axis. Oh, wow. That's actually cool. I didn't realize PowerPoint did that. New toy. So, um, so this is a, so that these two guys, as we're going to see next, can now help us do discrete time convolution. Trust me, discrete time convolution is not as bad as continuous time convolution. Again, another reason to love discrete time because you don't have oh my dear, this continuous time convolution always scared scared me like no tomorrow. All right. So, um, so we have these, these two elements. We also have things like signal addition, signal multiplication, and signal scaling. So signal addition, so if you have x of n and you have y of n, um, it's sample by sample addition. So what do I mean to say? So let's say we look at all of those three individually. Oh, no, 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 no. OK. So what do I mean? Um, so for instance, like signal addition. So let's say I have going into this adder, I have 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1. And let's say this guy here is 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. Okay? And let's say that's 0 and that's 0. So what would the addition of those two guys be equal to? 1, 1. 0, and then it would be 1, 1, and then 2, right? So we basically what we would do is we would have match these two, sum them together, 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 and sum them together. So it's basically pointwise pairing sum 
and then that whatever time instant they're at, they still maintain that time instant, but it would be the sum of those two individual points. Multiplication, exact same deal. Multiplication is the exact same deal. So let's say we take that exact same waveform, but instead of adding them, we multiply them. What we end up getting is what is 1 times 0? Zero? 0. What is 0 times 1? 0. What is 0 times 0? Zero? 0. 1 times 0? Bless you. 0. And same thing until we hit the 1, 1, and that's a 1. So multiplication of two waveforms would be pairwise multiply, 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 and assign that time value where both of them belong to. Last but not least is the scaling. If you take a single waveform, let's say we take this guy here, and I say, I want to scale everything by a factor of A. I multiply all the individual samples by A in, in order to scale it. All right. So, so those are kind of the basic functions that we can use to manipulate and, and play with uh, different uh, discrete time signals. Now let's look at discrete time systems. And so uh, we're kind of going back to what I was describing to before regarding this black box model. So a discrete time system, w w when we have a filter, we have some processor, we have some sort of module that we feed in the signal and a signal pops out of it, what we do is like we like to look at it as some sort of black box and we want to characterize that black box in terms of its operation. So what we normally do is that input excites the black box and then the output is the response to that input somehow, right? So what we want to do is, and we'll see this later on, there's something called transfer function. And the transfer function explains how the input, any input, gets mapped to a corresponding output. And so it characterizes how that black box operates. Okay? And that box, uh, just like I mentioned, there are four basic types of waveforms, when in fact there are only two, and the other two are just for fun. They're actually, um, out of, there are four here basic building blocks for any sort of discrete time system, but in reality there are only really three. Um, the unit advance element, you don't see much, especially in uh, real time systems because then you have non-causality and it, it kind of gets a little tricky. So what you've got here is you've got the adder. You've got the thing that sums the two signals together. You have the signal multiplier that multiplies the two signals together. The one thing we have not looked at so far at, across this lecture and the other two is something called the unit delay. That introduces now memory into the system. This now introduces the ability for us to say, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's look at the previous sample, the sample that we already looked at. Let's feed that into our current processing algorithm. So, so what we're doing is we're introducing memory and this is kind of useful because with that memory, we can do more fancier types of signal processing techniques where we don't just impact the one single sample right here, right now, but we also look at past values to help us do more of that processing that we would like to do. So the, the unit delay element's great because it introduces memory where we kind of keep in a holding pattern past values that have already gone into the system. Again, the unit advance I, I don't know how often all of you would use it. Uh, unit advance is a little tricky because the unit advance means let's go into the future and hold on to this value until we really need it. And yeah, well, I don't know about you guys, but I don't, I'm not like Stewie Griffin from Family Guy and I have a time machine in my bedroom. I, I'm not like that. I wish I did, but no. So um, really, you know, here are four basic building blocks. Three you're probably going to use very often, especially in real-time applications. Um, th but this is how you string together any which way your, your discrete time um, um, uh, system. Okay? So for instance, like here's a great one. I want to create an output based on the combination of these inputs. Oh my god. So it is basically a previous version of an output and the current input and a previous version of the input, how do I do this, how do I do this, how do I do this? And, and the answer is easy. I basically put the input into a holding pattern. So I delay it by one time instant and feed it back into the system. I take the current input, process it right away. I take a previous value of the input, hold on to it for a single unit, 
and then process it along with the rest of them. It looks like this. So let's look at this more closely, OK? So what we've got, here's your input. It goes straight away, multiplied by 0.5, goes straight to the output. That's one part of three that forms the desired output of our system. The next one is this holding pattern. It's like, take the input, OK, one potato. OK, now go straight to the output with this multiplicative factor. The thing you've got to remember is that everything is traveling, theoretically, if it's made of copper or maybe fiber or whatever, it's traveling at the speed of light. It is instantaneous. Don't think that it's like a river and it's canoeing down towards the output. No, things are going essentially lightning fast. This last one, oh, I love this last one. Take output. Hold on to a value for one, one potato, one second, or one unit of time. Multiply by whatever the weight is. Feed it back into this entire system. Boom! You have the output that you want. So that's the beauty of the system. All you really need at the end of the day in this course are z minus 1s. z minus 1, when you see z minus 1, you know it's a delay. When you see just z, it's that time advance thing that I don't know how to use in real life. And then you have pluses and x's and all that things together. Oh, it should be noted these little triangles with numbers above them, that's kind of like uh, the shorthand for weight, like, you know, it's multiplying against a scalar, okay? So it's not multiplying against another waveform. Essentially, that's your amplifying term for that waveform. So in that case, the previous output value is weighed by 0.25. Um, the input, the instantaneous input value, is weighed by 0.5. Uh, the last input value, delayed, right, is weighed by 0.5. All of that summed together to give us a desired output that we saw on the previous slide. Whew. OK. So. Um, a little bit of the classification. OK, so there's the static and the dynamic. So one's memoryless, one has memory. One depends only on the current time instant. One depends on uh, current and other instances of time of the entire uh, input sequence. But that's nice. But this guy, this guy, time invariant versus time varying, as well as linearity and nonlinearity are kind of really important because you're going to see throughout the rest of the course three key letters, LTI, right? Linear time invariant systems, right? So let's, let's look at this piecemeal and then we'll put together this concept of LTI, okay? <laughs> okay, so when something's time invariant, it means the following. So suppose I have a block, right? Some system. That's the black box. And I have x of n. And I have y of n. What time invariant means is that now if I have x of n plus some delay or minus some delay, I get a corresponding delayed output for all possible, like, you know, if I have all these possible delayed inputs and I get the corresponding delayed outputs, then this system is time invariant. So, so essentially, if I feed in an input and I get an output, and then I feed in a delayed input, I should get the exact matching corresponding delayed output for all possible delays. That's time invariant. So that's part one. Part two. <gasps> part two is fantastic, OK? So that guy here, that's. Ti. Now, linearity is when we have, let's say, you have system, like let's say you have your black box system, and you have x1. So that's signal x1, and it produces signal y1 at the output. Now, you feed in x2 of n, feed it into the same black box, and you get y2 at the output. Linearity says that if I have x1 of n plus x2 of n, and I feed it into the black box, out comes a monster. No, out comes out y1 plus y2 of n. So that is linearity. Now, the, the, the fun thing, the, the really cool thing, the LTI combines these two guys together. You're going to see this 
almost all the time in this course, is essentially if you have this and this. So let's say now you have x1 n plus n plus x2 n plus n, and you feed it into that black box. What you're going to get at the output is y1 n plus n plus y2 n plus n. Okay. So what happens is if you treat it individually, um, like you know, so so what ends up happening is if you have individual systems and you uh, and you feed y1 in uh, x1 in, you get y1 and it's the time invariant, and you do the same thing with x2, and you get y2, and it's time invariant. And when you add the two together, and you feed into the same system, and you get the sum of the outputs, and they're also time invariant, you call it LTI. I think that's the punchline of this lecture, LTI. OK, you can go home. No, 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 no. Not, not so fast. I have two more minutes with you guys. Ha, ha, ha. So LTI. Here's the other thing, the causality and the non-causality. Causality just means we can't look to the future, right? It's like, I am, in five minutes, I'm going to get a cell phone call. No! So causality just means you can only look at inputs to your system at the present and in the past. You have no ability to look in the future. Non-causal, um, on the other hand, means you can look at the past, present, or future to create the, the, the desired instantaneous output value. But there's a difference. There's non-causal and there's anti-causal. You know, just like anti-matter and matter, right? Um, so anti-causal means you're only looking to the future, right? And non-causal just means, hey, you're looking at future values, past values, whatever. You're just, you're definitely just not causal. Anti-causal is very specific. It's the opposite of causal. And last, lastly, there's stability. And stability just means if you design a system and you feed an input into it, you're absolutely certain that whichever input you feed into it, it does not become unbounded. It does not explode. All right? And then, of course, there's the definition of cascade versus parallel. So that's kind of implied. Because what you can do Oh, what you can do in discrete time systems is, let's say you don't want one filter or DSP or whatever, but you want two acting in series, right? We call it cascade. So let's say you want to filter out the noise of your speech signal, and then you want to enhance some of the frequencies in your speech signal. You have one filter, and then you have another filter lined up right after it. So signal goes in here. Output goes as an input to the next system, and it produces a new output. You're cascading two operations. Parallel just means I'm taking the same input signal, working on it on two different processes, and then taking the outputs and summing them together. All right? Oh, OK. I already jumped the gun. Uh, I already talked about LTI systems. Ha, ha, ha. OK, so we're moving along. The convolution sum. So let's, let's just talk a little bit about this, OK? So the convolution sum is um, continuous time is very messy. So in the in the in the uh, discrete time is actually quite nice. So the the continuous uh, the discrete time convolution sum is as follows. Hmm. So so what happens is suppose I want to convolve this guy. Okay. So maybe so first of all maybe as a quick question how would I make this guy from uh, you know from those basic four waveforms, and the answer is the following: I would take basically a unit step step function that starts at zero, at zero, and I would subtract from it a unit step function that's negated, so ne negative one unit step function. Actually, let me do this right. It looks very sloppy. So what I would do is essentially take this guy. And I would take another unit step function, but I would negate it. So here's 0. Here's 0. I would negate it and delay it by a little bit. And when you do that, you sum the two together. What you're left with is this. See? So that's kind of like the fun tools of having those basic waveforms. Now, suppose I take this guy, and I want to convolve him with, say, himself. How would you do convolution with 
In this case, these two waveforms. So let's say we call this x of n, and we call this y of n, when in fact it's the same thing. And the, the, the procedure is as follows. So first of all, you choose one of them. So let's say we choose this guy. He's, he, he's lucky. Okay. The first thing you do is you rotate around the y-axis. You flip him. And so, so what you would do is you would get this. Okay. Now what you do is you steadily, so remember that uh, time shifting operation I was t telling you guys about. What you do is you steadily take the two waveforms, multiply them, and then sum up all the samples multiplied with each other and then assign it to that, uh, that sampling time instant. And then you shift one of the waveforms by one, repeat the operation, sum it all together, assign it to that point, shift the operation, and you just continuously do that. And you might wonder, how do I, what do I mean by that? So let's say you have this guy. So that's 0, multiplied with this guy. So only this guy would overlap. So let's say these are values of 1. So that's a 1, right? And everything else is 0. And then let's say we assign it. So this we didn't shift at all. So let's say that's uh, 0. So that's a 1. Now, uh, we repeat the process. Let's say we shift this guy. So now let's shift him by 1. So now it's the zeros here. OK, now we have 1 and 1. So now the product of these two guys, 1 and 1, and sum gives us a 2. Now let's do this again. Let's shift this guy by one more to the right. So now it's 0. And multiply again. Oh, now we have a sum them together. We have a 3. Shift again. Now we, they're completely overlapping. We get 4, right? So that's a, 1 times 1 is 1, 1 times 1 is 1, 1 times 1 is 1. And then sum, that gives us a 4. And then you notice that this thing goes down. And that, like, you know, this is my sanity check. The reason why I chose this in particular is when you take two rectangular waves and you convolve them, you make a triangle, right? And that's what we got there. We basically have this free time version of triangle. It's a little sloppily dr drawn. It should be a little higher, but essentially, what you've got here is your triangle. All right. So let's, let's wrap things up. So um, I have an example, so all of you should try that out at home. Last but not least, you have commutative, uh, associative, and distributive laws. Um, and this really relates how input signals and systems relate with each other when you convolve them together, when you have multiple systems and multiple signals in different combinations. So what I would suggest doing as an exercise for all of you at home, in addition to trying out the convolution example I just tried, um, is to read sections 2.35, 2.36, 2.37. 2 um, again, I'll be posting the problem sets with solutions sometime tomorrow morning. Okay? So um, I wish I could put it up tonight. I know all of you are really eager to get started. Um, but I will post that online. And again, um, I hope to update the course syllabus. Uh, with, with um, the necessary information for you guys so you can also reach the link. So with that, that concludes uh, Lecture 3 of uh, 503. Okay. So with that also, so um, if you have any questions, let me know. Um, I have office.